What's a museum, folks? It's done good. It's a temple. They build a temple in Glasgow and they put Michael's trees from Brewarna in their temple. And say, since it's in our temple, we own their symbols. That's true. They say that's how they articulate your symbols and therefore they have your sovereignty. Yeah, now, definitely. let me tell you something that will fascinate you even more. At the same time these guys were looking for Chinese customary law and didn't find it, even though it was in the libraries all over the East, mm. East Asia, mm. they also said the trouble with the Chinese is they don't have any ritual statutes. Because ritual, as you would know, mm. is how the top level of governance works. The people need to see some sort of predictability in the behaviour of the rulers. If they can't see that, he's not a good ruler. So anyhow, it's well known that the ritual statutes of the Chinese dynasties are enormously well organised, with volumes and volumes and volumes going back thousands of years. And in the mid-1500s, the Ming Emperor said, one of the best things about our system of govern government is we make sure that our statutes are all ritually correct and conforming with heaven so that the people can trust the government. And the English said, they don't do it. And back in London they said, oh well, since they don't do it, we'll have to step in and do it. Okay, why am I telling you all this? Because these folks in Australia that you're dealing with are right down the bottom of this long chain of landless serfs. Why are they landless? Because they keep on changing the land title system until nobody can figure out what's going on anymore. And when you buy your house, you only own the land down to there and they're going to frack underneath it anyhow. Mm -hmm. And your house is going to fall in, but that's no problem because they have the right to do it. So you're landless. So they've sent all these landless serfs out here who don't know anything and who follow all this mumbo jumbo that we've seen going on in Hong Kong and now going on here, a hundred years later, the same pattern. And they are definitely not principals in a negotiation. They have no idea. They don't know what planet they're standing on. You tell them that the serpent that created the area has, is an independent entity of which you're a part, and, and that'll just bounce off the side of their head. They won't even look at it. Why would you look at it? It's not English. Okay, so the reason why I'm telling you all this is, is that your law is 60, 70, 80,000 years old, whatever it is. Their law is 10 minutes old, maybe 20 minutes maximum. It has absolutely no force in the annals of time. My people sat in the great academies of Babylon with what's now called Arabs several thousand years ago and studied together and our children married each other while these people in Britain hadn't even invented loincloths yet. <laughs> that was too hard. And when I taught these Iraqi people in Malaysia, it was wonderful to be with them. You could feel the bond. It, it's just natural. So you can't have an agreement with someone who's incapable of having that feeling and who's incapable of understanding what you're saying. Agreement is not possible. Therefore, Treaty is not possible now unless you do it another way. You can take their pronouncements. And under the rules for the laws of treaty, you can put that together and say, this is the de facto treaty. Yes. Next slide, please. That's true. Next slide, please. OK. That's going back again. Oh, no, that's going backwards. One more. Yeah. OK, one more. We've done that. I decided to do it in a different order. OK. Now, this is important. This is in the convention. Who can represent a state? 
A person is considered as representing a state for the purpose of adopting or authenticating the text of a treaty <coughs> or for the purpose of expressing the consent of the state to be bound by a treaty if he produces appropriate full powers. Appropriate means proper, mm -hmm. and proper means conforming to ritual statutes, which in international diplomatic law, which it means it conforms to all the protocols of diplomacy. Got to be in the right form, got to follow all the history of the way diplomacy has happened in the last several hundred years. That's <coughs> propriety. If he's not doing that, if they send someone like a policeman who's following orders from somebody, he doesn't have appropriate full powers. He might have power, and you might be scared of him because he might take a gun out. Did you see about the Eastman case over the last couple of days? You know what, has everyone seen that? No. About 20 years ago, somebody was murdered in, in Canberra, right? It, it was uh, the assistant police commissioner of the federal police, one Mr. Winchester. And they said that Mr. Eastman did it. And they put him in jail for 19 years. Now he's out after they've proven conclusively that he never did it. What's the upshot of all this? The Winchester family is very upset that he's out. It's not of any substantive meaning to them whatsoever that he didn't do it. It's only upsetting to them that he's out. Now, well, how would you like to negotiate with people like that a treaty? Can't be done. So how do you negotiate a treaty? You have to say to the people who do the order in council, you know, it's all been fun, guys, but we can't deal with your deals anymore. It's completely open to us to see what you've done. It's complete idiocy. Even President Sukarno said in the early 1950s at the Non-Aligned Conference, he said the problem with the English colonialists is they just can't figure out how to rule with wisdom. Right? They can't figure it out. It's because the people who make the orders in council make sure that no one else is going to make an order in council because none of them have got the brains to do it. And they select by special breeding over the centuries people stupid enough to send overseas and follow orders even though they're on the opposite side of the planet. Imagine, what's an example of that? I'll give you a really good example. I was in Melbourne one day, many years ago, I was very young, I was about 30 years old, <clears throat> and, and I was working and I was with a colleague and we were, there's a park just near, uh, near South Yarra, and people were playing cricket, and they're all dressed up in their white clothes and they have something here so in case they should be hit by a ball just there. Why would you want to wear that unless you were worried about people aiming at balls uh, to your groin? And they had all the same hat and the same shirt and the sleeves are rolled up exactly the same way. And, uh, and, and I said to my colleague, who tells them to do that? How do they know what to do? And he said to me, it's the laws of cricket. And I said, who makes them? Oh, the Manchester Cricket Club. I said, not the Melbourne Cricket Club? No, Manchester. And I said, well, why do they agree to follow that? Wouldn't your own fathers and brothers and sisters have more effect on you here than their fathers and brothers and sisters on the other side of the planet that you've never met and are unlikely to e ever meet? Even when Michael goes to throw the flag over, he still doesn't meet her. She hides inside. Now, if I came to your house and knocked on the door, you'd probably open the door and say, what can I do for you? I'd do the same if you came to my house. But they don't do that. They don't open the door. They hide inside. How are you going to make an agreement with these folks? You've got to say, look, it's been fun. You've killed a lot of our people. But we can't deal with your deals anymore. You're going to have to remove your deals. Otherwise, we'll just move away and watch them stew in their own juice. 
which they are. They're skewing in their own juice now. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. The benefit for the folks who make the orders and council of having slaves at the bottom is that that way it's easier to execute a fraud. Because these people follow orders. We've already covered this earlier in the talk, haven't we? They'll do criminal acts because you'll know if you've ever been in a corporation that when the law of the land says this, but the manager said something that conflicts with the law of the land, the manager wins every time. Mm. And people do stupid, tortious, breach of contract, breach of private law things, criminal things, and never get prosecuted because the manager said it. Okay? So you can get these people to do anything. Now, we don't know what fraud is. There is no crime of fraud. It's a concept. And when I was doing my PhD some years ago, one of the supervisors said, you better do a section, Gary, on commercial fraud because you haven't defined it. So I had to look around. And I looked all around the world, and the only place in the world I found that got anywhere close to defining fraud and its relationship with deceit was an author in India called Narayanan, who wrote a book that thick on the tort of passing off, which is passing off your product as someone else's product. Imagine if you and me make a bottle of Coca-Cola and make it look like the Coca-Cola's company's bottle, and we sell it to people as Coca-Cola. That's the tort of passing off. In his textbook, that thick, and I'd never heard of this guy, he explained the relationship between deceit and fraud so well that I want to pass these insights to you today because it's going to show you the relationship between war, deceit, and fraud. That's very important. By the way, when I got to India years ago, when I was just an associate professor, I said to the director of the law school there in Bombay, Mumbai, I said to her, and I got this stuff from Narayanan. And she said, oh yes, very well known here. Widely known, with about a billion people hovering around us. They knew, but no one knows here. Why is that? How have they kept the definition of fraud away from the people here who are being defrauded? In the same way that they can put up a stone marker and you don't think it's a stone marker because inside that marker is a very nice person called Jesus. How can that be an international law concept with such a very lovely person inside? The fraud's unbelievable. It's enough to make you weep. Okay, let's look at it. I'll go through it with you. There's two steps. The first step is deceit. The second step is fraud. This is what Narayanan said. Now if one person by his or her conduct or words induces a state of mind in another person that is false, that's called deceit. Step one. That's step one. So there you are, you've been deceived. You have a certain view. That stone church is a lovely Jesus building. It's not an international law marker of sovereignty. That's a false position. That's an exercise in deceit. Step two. With that false view in your mind, and as a direct consequence of having that false view, if you then act to your detriment, you act to your detriment, then the first person who deceived you is now in a state of having committed fraud. Okay? Now this is beautiful, because here you are rushing around doing stupid things, and they say, well, it's not our fault, he did it himself. And nobody can see the two steps. Now what's an example of the first step? What's an example of words or conduct that can induce a false 
position in a person's mind. Anyone got any ideas? What is it? Can't hear you. Terra nullius is interesting. It was there was no such concept in Roman law. Did you know that? Said to have been der derived from the Roman imperial law. Mm. No such concept ever existed in Roman law. It was invented in about the 1840s and they used it in California, East Asia, Australia and a few other places. Invented by the... There's even a California court case in the 1840s uh, where the people from the East of the United States uh, used Terra Nullius for the first time. I thought that the, they declared it Terra Nullius when they came here in 17... No. no, because the concept hadn't been invented then. <laughs> I said to a professor at ANU, not only was Marbo wrong when they said that terra nullius didn't apply, but there was never any such thing as terra nullius. And for the court to say, oh, well, terra, terra nullius doesn't apply is an implied recognition of a doctrine that never existed. That's basically the doctrine of if you walk away from your, your glasses for five minutes, the glasses are mine. Even though it's the wrong prescription. Such as, for example, if you send all these dill to a criminals and idiots to Australia, and there's all these first people there with a well-developed culture over thousands of years who know what they're doing, and have indigenous traditional farming where they know what's under the ground and what's going to happen next. Because I've published papers on this, I've interviewed people on this. They come in from Britain, they can't see any of it. Mm. There might be a bottle tree here and there might be an anthill there and the indigenous people know what's going on under the ground. But the Anglos can't see it, therefore it doesn't exist. That's like when we're little children, and I've watched my children do it. You put your finger up like this, and you say, I can't see you, therefore you can't see me. That's the level of stupidity we're dealing with here. It's like a sheep putting his head down behind a block of grass, thinking he, nobody can see him. That's right. Okay. And that's what you're dealing with in your agreement for a treaty here. Can I, did, can I just say another <laughs> thing as well? Um, on this concept of terra nullius, um, if you go and have a look at a court case, I think it's 1836, um, um, Jack Kungo Murrell in uh, Sydney, where they charged him with um, killing, he did a tribal killing, yeah, in, uh, on the Nepean River. And they charged him with murder. And then the, the uh, Reverend Threlkeld was the only bloke who could speak the language of the Aurora and the Oabical, um around the Hawkesbury River. And so he translated in this court case and um, that Justice Forbes was, um, right. was the presiding judge. And um, Kungar Murrell challenged the validity of the court to charge him and challenged the jurisdiction. And um, there's, when you look at the decision of, um, of uh, Forbes, it's very, very telling, um, even now. And it, it has impacts now as well because common law, with common law precedents, it does in fact have relevance in law today. This is where it was first decided that Australia was terra nullius. But it wasn't that the land was empty. It was because the Aborigines of Australia had no houses, no permanent structure, no uh, belief in a higher God order. Yeah. Their God, in other words. Their, their God. Yeah. If you didn't so believe they, in their God, who yeah. are you? That, so there was nothing. And then the other thing was that um, we didn't till the land. They said we didn't till the soil. And, uh, they, and we, were, we were nomads. And that's where we became fixed within the concept of flora and fauna. Yeah? Because we lived off the land, we were nomads and we were wandering around. And so this, this bloke said, well, no. Um, that, that there's not, um, they, they don't have these rights uh, because they don't have these structures in place. We can't see any. Yeah, it's ne there's no, no evidence. Therefore they're not there. Therefore they're not there and therefore they're terra nullius. And so, they, fit uh, with, they fit within, this, uh, within the def definition of being part of the flora and fauna. So a man is peering before the court, as Michael's just told you, 
and he has the presence of mind and intelligent intelligence to make a challenge to jurisdiction. That's a high level of intellect. Would you think of doing that? No, probably not. There's laws about that, yeah. about jurisdiction. And they're saying, oh, well, no, no, he's not here, it's Terranomius. And can I, can I just say yeah. too? In that case, then, then, then they said that um, he was a person, but because he, uh, the Crown had now assumed control over the country, and he couldn't assert the argument of sovereignty because he, all of these other elements were missing, mm. um, one of the, then they said, well, no, he's a, he's a, he is a British subject and therefore we can prosecute him. Interestingly enough, the next application by that Murrell's lawyer um, was that, well, if he's an Englishman and if he's a British subject, then the laws of England apply to him, then he is eligible then to claim for compensation for the land that was taken from him. And the judge quickly shut that discussion down. Okay, so... Listen to what they did in Hong Kong after the treaty, mm. and I'll read you a couple of sentences, and you'll die of shock about how recognisable this is. The treaty opened up five Chinese ports to foreign trade and permitted foreign missionaries into central China. Foreign criminals in the five port cities were to be tried by their own authorities instead of by the Chinese legal system. In other words, the police are not allowed to try criminals in China. Yeah. Consequently, under a principle of extraterritoriality, the UK established the British Supreme Court for China and Japan. Under the same principle, the United States established its own court in China in Shanghai. They very apparently traversed all of the five principles. Oh, I haven't explained it. So basically what you're seeing here is everything that's already been done in other colonies before. And as Michael just said, um, the early phases of the Western European treatises on sovereignty in international law said that only nations that were civilised could have sovereignty. Okay? And the Chinese said, listen, bub, we've been here for thousands of years. We think you're a bunch of bills. And the issue of civilised nations was removed from the treatises. It was removed, but it took a while, but it was removed. It's very interesting. So it's not anything unusual that's happening here. They're running the same system all around the world because it works. Yari, can I, can I just say this as well so yeah. that you, you all know? The interesting commentary here of this, what Gary's saying, is that he's made the point about the churches, the stone churches, right? And what I'm reminded of is the fact that when, when during the Yamada, yeah, the, the British, the Spanish, and everybody was blowing each other on that little channel, you know, in that little bit of water there, you can swim across it, but they were shoot, killing each other big time there. And... Um, and England don't have trees because they had to build all the boats. That's why they, they cut all the trees down. They had to build all the boats to keep this war up. And interestingly enough, they then went to the Pope to settle this dispute, to mediate between these countries. And that's when the Pope began to issue, uh, the Roman uh, Catholics then began to issue these decrees and divide the world up. So that belongs to Spain, this one belongs to England, this one down here belongs to Portugal, etc. And in the middle, the Dutch flew in on the other side. And so, in amidst, amongst all this, they, the, the international law then was prescribed by those papal bulletins. The, they call them the papal bulls. Even though they'd never met anyone in the bulk of the population of the world. That's correct. And so they then decided in these, in these laws, and they became the international laws, the charters that ruled how things were done. These laws then prescribed that if you found a country where they didn't have a common Christian belief or, a, or belief in an higher order, then that's regarded as vacant land because they're non-Christians. And accordingly, it is argued that the text of the Bible says that the, one of the covenants between Abraham and God was that his children shall go out and take, and take the land of the pagans and the, the non-Christians, non-believers, 
and uh, infidels and be able to supplant their authority and usurp the, usurp the land. Except that Abraham had a treaty with a guy called Malchi Tzedek in Jerusalem that said that Arabs and Jews are to occupy Jerusalem together as brothers in peace in perpetuity. And the folks who live in Jerusalem today, if you walk the streets, all know about that treaty. Yeah. But you don't hear about it here. The Treaty of Melchizedek. Hmm. So, okay. so anyway, I, I say that simply because the, it, a lot of what England did and based all their laws on, they argued that they got that from God. Right. Yeah. The Roman Catholic yeah. But they, what he's talking about here is the standard feudal discussion. A feudal discussion is where you talk with her yeah. about something that affects him, him that's right. and you don't talk to him about it. No, that's right. And in my research I found that when the British got to Australia, they weren't worried about the local inhabitants as much as they were worried about other European nations coming here that's and true. having a war with them. That's right. Yeah. So they had a war with the people here yeah. to get control so that the other European nations would say, oh, well, looks like they've taken it, nothing we can do. Yeah, they've got right. control of the land, therefore they've got supplies and food, yeah. right? That's what it was all about. Right. Okay, let's look at this. Now, uh, how does this fraud and deceit operate? The, the master goal of colonialism is slavery. The master crime of the world is enslavement, enslaving people. And I don't want to go into the theory in a lot of depth, or in any depth at all, but the main method of enslaving people is by deceit. You deceive people into slavery. CDT. What's that? CDT. That's the modern day slavery program for Aboriginal people in communities. What's it called? CDT. Community Development Programs. Oh, right. So you've got a good job. Yeah, so I said to a South African, African person once, I said, how did you get all those people in Africa to, give, to, be, to be enslaved like that? And he said to me, we just told them they were getting a good job. Now, it must have been a little bit more complex than that. They must have started out with sticking a knife in someone's back or kicking a baby's head off, the same as they did here. Okay, so in international law, you have what's called peremptory norms. And a peremptory norm is a concept that everyone has to obey whether they like it or not. And the peremptory norms include slavery, torture, genocide, and a few more. The master one is slavery. Torture, genocide, and the others are methodologies for implementing slavery. Why do you want slavery? Because as Michael explained to us earlier on, once the wage rate goes from 85 cents an hour to $5.85, the business collapses. So the bubble of oxygen that sustains these people from Britain collapses without slavery. That's why they have the backpacker visas. And they're extending it so that these kids from other countries are going to end up sleeping on the road unless they can get a good job picking oranges at the farm. They just changed the law, by the way, on sleeping on the road because there was, the police were telling the young people, those backpackers, to move on and they were not allowed to sleep on the roads. They had to sleep in a caravan, but they didn't have the money, so in caravan parks, so they didn't have so that forces money. them to get a good so job on the farm. So that forces them to get a job on the farm. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. This all started with King Athelstan in Britain, by the way, who divided the men of the kingdom into, into two. They were either people who made things or people who rode horses. So if you were neither <laughs> making something nor riding a horse, you had to go to jail. King Athelstan. This is before the... I don't know how they can say they're conquered if their kings were doing that to them. It sounds like they were always conquered. Okay, but so... That, but, that, but that's the same as with the old um, laws in Australia there, mm. where if you didn't have any money in your pocket, 
yeah, That's then you could, you could be charged with vacancy. Yeah. Yeah. And when, when we set the embassy up, we had no money. Yeah. And Chica Dixon came to us and he said, see them donations, Michael? He didn't make sure he put, put money in each other. You oh, well, what's money, folks? Do you know what money is? It is a unit of servitude. Every time he has more money or she has more money than me, I'm in servitude to her. That's why Chairman Mao tried the great leap forward in the late 50s and abolished money and 20 million people died. Because the people who implemented it for him didn't want that to work. So he had to cop the blame for it. Next slide. 